Tonight's webinar is Psychology of Sclera Lenses and Billing and Coding. I want to start by uh, welcoming you all and then welcoming our presenters tonight. We'll put their disclosures up on the screen here. We'll start with Dr. Melissa Barnett. She is the Principal Optometrist at the University of California Davis Eye Center in Sacramento. She's an internationally recognized key opinion leader specializing in anterior segment disease and specialty contact lenses. Dr. Barnett lectures and publishes extensively on topics including dry eye, anterior segment disease, contact lenses, and creating a healthy balance between work and home life for women in optometry. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American uh, Board of Certification in Medical Optometry, a fellow of the British Contact Lens Association, and serves on the board of the American Optometric Association Cornea and Contact Lens Council, Women in Optometry, uh, Women of Vision, Gas Permeable Lens Institute, Ocular Surface Society of Optometry, and she is the past president of the Sclera Lens Education Society. Dr. Barnett is a spokesperson for the California Optometric Association and a guest lecturer for the Staple Program. Uh, Drs. Melissa Barnett and Lynette Johns edited the book Contemporary Sclera Lenses, Theory and Application, with unique perspectives and contributions of international experts. Dr. Barnett was awarded the inaugural Thea Award for Excellence uh, for Mentoring by Women in Optometry. Uh, in her spare time, she enjoys cooking, yoga, hiking, spending time with her family. Dr. Todd Erickson, who's also an optometrist, and her two sons, Alex and Drew. Our other presenter tonight is Dr. Stephanie Wu. She was born and raised in Lake Havasu, Arizona. She graduated magna cum laude from University of Arizona and graduated with honors from Southern California College of Optometry. She completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, where she was trained to fit highly irregular corneas. She was the recipient of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute Award for Clinical Excellence and also the John R. Griffin Award for Excellence in Vision Therapy. Dr. Wu is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Sclera Lens uh, Society. She authored the Gas Permeable Lens Expert Column in Review of Contact Lenses. She authored several articles for Contact Lens and Cornea Section of the American Optometric Association. Dr. Wu co-authored the GP Insights column for the contact lens spectrum, and she's an active GPLI advisory board member. Dr. Wu currently serves as the president of our very own Scleral Lens Society. She enjoys lecturing around the world on the subject of contact lenses and anterior segment disease, and Dr. Wu owns Havasu Eye Center, Parker Vision Care, and Blythe Vision Care. So with that, before I turn it over to Dr. Barnett, I just want to quickly thank the sponsors of the Scleral Lens Society. We'll run through those quickly here. Our diamond sponsors include Art Optical, AVT, Bausch & Lomb Specialty Vision Products, Blanchard Contact Lenses. Our platinum sponsors include AccuLens, Alden Optical, Conamac, Essilor, Menicon, OptiView, Paragon Vision Sciences, Synergize, Trueform Optics, Visionary Optics, and Excel Specialty Contacts. And the rest of our sponsors include Valley Contacts, Boston Foundation for Sight, ABB Optical, Visionary, uh, Easy, uh, lens applicators in today's vision. And I believe that's it for sponsors. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Barnett. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And it's a special honor and privilege to give this webinar with the president of the Sclera Lens Education Society, Stephanie Wu. So we have two kind of different topics that we're combining tonight. And we're giving you an overview of each of them, of course, we can go into far more depth on each of them as well. And we encourage you to become active in the Scleral Lens Society, where we can talk about more of these topics in more detail. But we all know the basic indications for scleral lenses. So we can rehabilitate the cornea. They're great for ocular surface disease management and help with pain. Many of the patients we see on a daily basis have 
a lot of irregular corneas. I can tell you I'm coming straight from clinic today, seeing many patients with different diseases, including keratoconus. And we know with keratoconus, there are many different things that can happen during the course of a person's lifetime. The bottom middle picture, for example, is acute high drops. You can see some images here of scleral lenses. And I'm gonna share in a little bit an experience of a patient that I saw today, new patient with keratoconus. So let's review some of the studies specifically about keratoconus to start. If you haven't seen this study, this is one of my favorites that came out recently. This study talks about scleral lenses and how they reduce the need for corneal transplants in severe keratoconus. The really unique aspect of this study that came out late last year is that Karina Koppen is both a scleral lens practitioner and a surgeon. So she does both in her practice, which I think is absolutely amazing. So in different parts of the world, um, different people fit scleral lenses, but she is one who does both. So in this study, they evaluated the success and failure rates of scleral lenses in severe keratoconus. All patients had keratoconus. They were evaluated between January 2010 and December 2014. There were 75 eyes in this study. They all had maximum K readings of more than 70 diopters. And scleral lenses were used in 51 out of 75 eyes. In this study, 40 out of 51 eyes with severe, again, severe keratoconus that would otherwise have had a corneal transplant were successfully treated with long-term scleral lens wear. Thus, the indication for penetrating keratoplasty was more than reduced by half in the keratoconus population. So this study is so true in my day-to-day -day practice. I work with three corneal specialists within my practice and many corneal specialists from the greater four-hour area that are sending patients to be fit with scleral lenses to see if that is an option prior to a penetrating keratoplasty. So Stephanie, I just wanted to get your opinion on this study. What do you think? Do you think that this study holds true in your practice? Yeah, Melissa, that's a that's a really interesting study and I, I think it is absolutely true in my practice. Um, I've got lots of severe keratoconus patients that they would have had to have a transplant, um, but because of scleral lenses, that has really given us the ability to fit these highly, highly irregular corneas um, that otherwise maybe uh, 20 years ago would not have been successful in contact lenses and then they would have had to go to a transplant. So I think this is a, a very true reflection in my practice. Thank you. So moving on to different studies, there have been many studies that look at personality trends in people with keratoconus. So this study actually from where I am at UC Davis with Mark Manis and Carlos Zadnik looked and analyzed uh, personality trends in keratoconus. Now this study is from 1987. They looked at 109 subjects and they measured different personality scales. So subjects were divided into three groups, patients with keratoconus, patients with other chronic eye diseases, and normal patients. So the results of this study demonstrated that patients with keratoconus um, and chronic eye disease, it did have an impact on personality in young and middle-aged adults, but there was no specific complex of personality characteristics that could be identified in patients with keratoconus. However, patients with keratoconus differed from the normal controls, similar to other patients with chronic eye diseases. They were less conforming, more passive aggressive, and paranoid. And whenever I speak about this in front of people, I always get people coming up to me afterwards and with an example. Um, and again, I'm not saying that every single person at all has these personality trends. However, this is something that 
I do see in my clinic as well. So th this study determined that the influence of keratoconus on personality can be a function of the timing and nature of the onset, late teens, early 20s, and in the context of the patient's psychosocial development. So my first patient today, I told you I'd mentioned this story, came in, brand new patient to me, with a possible diagnosis of keratoconus, maybe, but not yet diagnosed. And I saw this young man, extremely classic, 22 years old, changes in refractive error with glasses, some scissors on retinoscopy, some mild corneal findings, and mapped his corneas, very, very clear evidence of keratoconus, asymmetric right eye more than left. And so, as we do, most of the visit was spent discussing options for him. We talked about cross-linking, we talked about contact lenses, we talked about why glasses would not help as much as he might like. And, and it was the first time he had heard the word keratoconus. And he is a graduating senior from college. He's going to go out into the world and experience life. And I said, you know, this is kind of a, a rough time, right, to, to, to talk about this. But the good news is, is that we can help a lot and we have lots of options. So fortunately, after we spent a lot of time, um, he was fit with scleral lenses, 20, 2015, doing great, talked a lot about the process and all that. And he did wonderful. But I always say that my undergraduate psychology degree uh, comes into play on a daily basis when we talk to our patients and, and work with scleral lenses. Moving on to a different study looking at personality and keratoconus. This one was from 1990, and this was just looking at different signs, and 54% of patients with keratoconus had signs that were abnormal. Bottom line here, patients who considered themselves moderately or severely limited by their eye condition were more likely to have abnormal scores 87% actually, than patients who thought they were mildly effective, affected 40%. The changes in quality of life in people with keratoconus, so this came out in 2007, and this was a prospective study from the CLEC study group. And again, just kind of getting to the bottom line here, that keratoconus is associated with a significantly impaired quality of life that continues to decline over time. Looking at yet another study um, in the vision-related quality of life in patients with keratoconus, this one was 2014, looking at 30 patients with keratoconus, 20 were rigid gas permeable contact lens wearers, 10 did not wear contact lenses, and 30 healthy patients were the control group, and contact lens wearers had better vision compared with non-contact lens wearers. And the vision-related quality of life was worse in patients with the keratoconus. Thus, the success with contact lenses and maintaining a better visual acuity and vision in general may improve the vision-related quality of life. Now this, you know, I don't know, I have favorite studies. This is another one of them that I always talk about, but I think it's very important as well. And I talk to my patients about this one too. The quality of life in patients wearing scleral lenses. So this came out of France in 2015, and they evaluated the improvement of quality of life with scleral lenses in keratoconus, or the treatment of astigmatism after penetrating keratoplasty. This one was a retrospective study, patients who were not tolerant of corneal gas permeable lenses, and evaluated the quality of life before and after adapting to scleral lenses. So you can see all the details here, 47 patients, 83 eyes. Scleral lenses showed a significant improvement in the quality of life for patients who had failed or were intolerant to conventional rigid gas permeable lenses. And scleral lenses are an alternative or step prior to surgery. So this is a wonderful study and I'm finding that my patients are hearing more about scleral lenses these days than they 
did five or 10 years ago. And this is something that we can talk to them about how it actually does improve their quality of life. A different patient with keratoconus today has been wearing corneal gas permeable lenses for 50 years. And she has had a graft that has, it, it's an old tilted graft. And I've talked to her about scleral lenses over the years. And today, finally, she decided that she was ready just for one eye to be fit with the scleral lens. Fortunately, she did great. Um, and the reason she decided is because her corneal gas permeable lens had popping up and she kept losing it. So with the, with the fitting today, she was 2020. She said it's the most comfortable lens she's ever had in 50 years. And so sometimes just trying a lens on, if you can in your practice, and I know everyone has such busy schedules and busy days, but even just trying to get a lens on the eye to have a patient experience it can really significantly change and improve their lives to just try out a scleral lens and see how it can help them. So now we're kind of going into understanding the process and I am sure all of you have heard the stories that come in and and on a daily basis sort of the patient journey and where they've been and how they got to you and I think everyone who works with scleral lenses is just simply amazing. But I really like to just listen to my patients a lot and hear their story. You know, where have they been? What have they tried? What worked? What didn't work? What symptoms do they have? What are their needs? You know, what sort of work do they do? What are their visual needs? Um, have they been fit with scleral lens before? If so, what worked? What did not work? What could be improved? And of course, the importance of the management of the underlying disease, often systemic disease and condition. So oftentimes there's a lot more to it than just the eyes. It's really looking at the whole person and the systemic disease. One of the things I've learned over the years is that with flare-ups, whatever it may be, graft versus host disease, Sjogren syndrome, severe or allergic conjunctivitis, they can really affect how the scleral lens fits. And I always joke in the Northern California area, I, I don't wanna fit lenses in March, like never because we have horrible, horrible allergies. But just keeping that in mind, I ask my patients often if they're having a systemic flare at that time or sort of what's going on. Because if you're fitting a lens and everything looks pretty good and you've looked at your notes and then you see them back, Sometimes things can look significantly different if they're having a flare. So tips to success. Remember, no two people are the same. It is important to hear the story and, and the patient journey. And I, my staff is wonderful in helping with this process. Uh, listen to understand, not to respond. A lot of times I'm listening to my patients and taking a lot of notes of their journey and their story, what they've tried, what they haven't tried, what, what has worked and what hasn't worked. And sometimes it's little tweaks or techniques that are really beneficial for them to help them with scleral lenses. The steps to active listening are comprehension, retention, reflecting, saying, oh, so I understand that the corneal gas permeable lens of the left eye keeps popping out clarification, so going over each detail, and then summarizing in a concise way, sort of what you heard. And after the summarization, you can talk about different options. And they might not all be scleral lenses. Um, there are many options, for example, for someone with keratoconus, including custom soft lenses and corneal gas permeable lenses and hybrid lenses and scleral lenses. So just kind of going over all the options. And really kind of putting yourself in your patient's shoes and making the patient feel safe and establishing that sense of trust. So going over different options, trying to establish a connection if possible, and going over just what might benefit this specific person, something maybe they haven't tried before. Scleral lens fitting can be extremely emotional, um, myself included. I will tell you, I have 
fits uh, at certain times during the day. One of them is at eight o'clock in the morning. And sometimes the patient is so happy that they are crying and then I'm crying. We're all crying. Everyone's crying. We're all so happy. And then that's sort of tough. You moving on to the next patient during during the next day. Now, everyone's not always so happy either. There can be other emotions that come out. There can be a lot of frustration. You know, I've tried that before. It didn't work. I don't want to try. Okay. You know, it's okay to take breaks and also come back on a different day, perhaps, if the person is ready. Uh, Stephanie, what about you and your practice? Um, do you find that sometimes fitting these patients is an emotional experience? Yeah, Melissa, I would agree with you that there are certain times where the patients are so excited that they can see. Like I had a patient that she hadn't been able to see more than hand motion for 10 years and we fit her with the scleral lens and she could see 2050. I mean, those types of things are just absolutely life changing. You know, imagine if you haven't seen anything except kind of shapes and blobs for 10 years and then suddenly you can actually read a book and you can look at your computer, you can you can see your grandkids face. I mean, those types of things are just super emotional. And then I also agree with you on the other side of the spectrum. There's just some patients that they just get very upset or they're just exhausted because they've tried everything else and they've tried this before and they've been to a million doctors and they see you and they just kind of have given up hope or you know, they've gotten so frustrated. So I definitely agree with these type of specialty patients. Um, you just have to be a little bit more in tune with their emotions and kind of their experiences. Thank you. It is really important to find out what is important to this specific person. You know, what is it that they want? Um, I have a lot of fun with multifocal scleral lenses, for example. Do they want to eliminate glasses? Do they want to help their severe pain that they experience on a daily basis? What is it that can make their life better? And fortunately, we do have this wonderful technology that can help them. It is important to not be just defensive uh, to a patient and it's sometimes I would say a little bit difficult because they are so mad or upset or don't want to try, but just listening and taking breaks. I really do enjoy when my patients bring in their family members to listen to. I find that a, another set of ears is helpful and I like talking to multiple people and sometimes I actually leave the room and have them discuss, you know, sort of different options and then come back. But it is important to be empathetic, especially when fitting these specialized cases. So empathy is sensing others' emotions and imagining sort of what they're going through and what they're thinking and feeling. And I'm going to move on to tools to cultivate empathy. So that's active listening, putting a human face on suffering, not thinking in your own head, you know, what are the a million things I need to do and all this. Um, but thinking about your patient and really what is best for them. Meditation is wonderful. Uh, playing games and um, taking lessons from babies. Who doesn't love babies? I think that's fantastic. Uh, barriers to scleral and success. And, you know, the seven stages of grief are so important. One of my patients, gosh, she's one of my favorites, I think, comes in and she has a severe corneal scar. The corneal surgeons don't want to do surgery. And she says every time, I don't like my lens. I don't like my scleral lens, but I can see. And I said, okay, well, you know, let's talk about our options and this and that. And she said, okay, I think I'm going to wear it. So we do have that discussion every time. But she's at the acceptance um, saying, okay, I, th I think we've gotten there. But at that initial visit, when you're diagnosing someone, especially with a condition that can affect them for the rest of their life, some patients are in shock and denial. Um, the anger definitely can come out. I've definitely seen that. Depression, I find, is really common as well. So having resources to help our patients is very important. Um, but then finally, 
getting to the acceptance is a great place for people to be. And I find that many people are really helpful at this point in time, they're understanding. I talk about the scleral lens process more than I ever did in 10 years. And then it that is really helpful, I find, it, describing that it might take several lenses and several visits so that patients understand. So different strategies, sometimes you might want to just talk to the patient about different options. The National Keratoconus Foundation is a wonderful resource for patients with keratoconus. The Scleral Lens Education Society has a great new section that goes over all conditions with peer-reviewed literature that you can help share with your patient and their other practitioners, whether it be rheumatology or oncology or psychiatry. And that's something that's also very, very helpful. And then talking about different treatments and different alternatives that can help them. I am skipping over a few slides here because I do want to get to one really important part of this. The danger zone is, is suicide. And I had a recent experience of a patient with, with Sjogren's syndrome that I saw last year, came in, referred for scleral lenses, severe dry eye, fit her successfully with scleral lenses, but it wasn't until maybe that third visit that she told me that she was suicidal. And I didn't know that at all. I didn't know that on the first visit or the second visit, but she was so affected by her severe dry eye that she didn't want to live anymore. Fortunately, with scleral lenses, she's much more comfortable and doing much better, which is fantastic. But it was a lesson that I learned that we don't always know when our patients are suicidal. And suicide is more common than we think. So the prevalence, this is what, according to the CDC, in 2015, suicide was the 10th leading cause of death in the US. And these statistics really scared me. Uh, age 10 to 14, it was the third leading cause of death, and, and 15 to 34, the second. So when we see these patients with graft versus host disease or Stephen Johnson, um, younger, even younger patients, I've learned just to be a little bit more aware and consider that they could, they definitely are going through a lot and perhaps they could be suicidal as well and just to have the resources to help them. So depression is a very common uh, factor. Alcohol, substance abuse are also associated with suicide. And knowing your personal limits is, is very, very important. And there are resources for professionals. So there, there are different professionals. And I would recommend if you don't have someone that you can refer to, just to establish a network. Um, of primary care doctors are wonderful. So talking to primary care doctors, talking to the rheumatologist or oncologist or corneal specialist, so really having a very open communication with all these specialists is helpful for your patients. Um, psychiatrists and psychologists are also helpful to help with mental health issues. Now, this is the important part that I think that all of us need to be aware of, and that is remembering to put your eye in eye care and especially when you're fitting specialty contact lenses. And this is really to prevent burnout. So physician burnout is when you feel exhausted, you have no energy, um, you're just not excited about what you're doing on a daily basis, you lose that empathy, you have doubt, you know, does any of this really matter? I'm just doing the same thing every day. But there are resources for practitioners. And these resources are really looking into wellness, so changing the term from burnout to wellness. And they have many different aspects that can help you as a doctor that will in turn help your patients. So there's a toolbox of many different things that can help you to prevent burnout and just some tools that are especially beneficial. 
Um, some of my favorites are meditation and yoga. The mindfulness-based stress reduction courses are also helpful. The spending time outdoors, that's Lake Tahoe, one of my favorite places ever. Sleeping, again, a hobby of mine. A healthy diet and exercise, but actually journaling and specifically writing down a highlight of your day is something that is beneficial. Sticking to a daily routine, getting up at the same time, going to sleep at the same time has been shown to be beneficial and spirituality as well. So I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Stephanie Wu. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and, you know, I know you didn't mention this in the beginning, but um, Melissa was one of the past presidents of the Scleral Lens Society. So she has amazing using tools and resources and she just sees so many scleral lens patients and I just feel like you know Melissa every time I listen to you lecture and we lecture together I just learn a ton so thank you so much for all of your uh, information okay so now we're going to move on to scleral lens billing and coding uh, next And billing and coding is obviously something not only with scleral lenses, but in just optometry and medicine in general. That's a very, very frustrating thing for lots of practitioners. And these reimbursement rates, they really vary uh, drastically between insurance carriers. And a lot of times it is really hard to find out what is the proper way to bill something. and you know, you may even call somebody from the same insurance company and get one answer from Maria, and then you call 20 minutes later and get a different answer from Karen. So it is a very frustrating and, and hard thing. Um, but the way I like to kind of think of it is billing and coding is like taxes and accountants. You know, if you take the same tax documents, which was, you know, just yesterday, uh, to different accountants, they can interpret that information differently. So one accountant might say, oh, okay, well, you can itemize this, you can take a deduction here, you could do this, and then you can take the exact same information to another accountant, and they might say, oh, well, no, you really can't take the deduction here, and oh, nope, you really can't do that. So with that same information, there's ways that it can be interpreted by different people. So uh, this lecture is basically kind of a summary of the things that I have found in my practice. Um, there was no specialty lens billing and coding at all before I joined the practice uh, about six years ago. And so I kind of had to learn all this stuff on my own and through our amazing billing department and staff members uh, together, we've, we've figured out a lot of these different answers. So my, um, my hope for you guys is to kind of learn from some of these things and uh, um, hopefully take away some beneficial tips so you're not doing all the footwork that I was. Next. So the economics of specialty contacts most vision insurances will reimburse pretty well for specialty lens fittings and devices. Next. And specialty lenses can include a lot of different things. So it could include standard soft lenses. So if you have somebody, let's say, that's aphakic, their vision insurance or medical insurance may cover the fitting and possibly the supply of contact lenses, even if they're just a soft lenses. A lot of people just think that specialty contact lenses are only gas permeable, but that's not necessarily true. It could be custom soft lenses, just regular standard lenses, uh, corneal gas permeable lenses, hybrids, and sclerals. Next. So specialty lenses can really be a profit source within your practice and a good source of revenue. And that's important to me as a private practitioner. Um, scleral lenses and specialty lenses in general account for a high portion of um, our income each year. Medical insurances compared to vision insurances can be a little bit more difficult to obtain the re appropriate reimbursement. With vision insurances, the authorization is pretty crystal clear. Is, is the patient eligible for lenses? 
um, how much are they going to give you for this fitting um, and the lenses with the diagnosis whereas medical insurances I have found to be a little bit more difficult and if you accept a lot of different types of medical insurances this really can become very tedious and time-consuming because you have to figure out are they eligible what are they eligible for what kind of lenses are covered what kind of diagnoses are covered so it, it's best to have some um, help in this area so you as a doctor are not spending hours and hours trying to figure this stuff out some practices build each visit to the insurance and other practices will do like a global fee it just kind of depends on what your contract is with that medical insurance and what you are comfortable doing in your practice so a lot of practitioners ask me well what is a good way to develop like a fee schedule you know how much uh, should I be charging for the fitting and how much should I be charging for the actual scleral lenses well the fitting fees will really range from low to high and that really depends on you as that the practitioner and the practice that you're working for my advice is to determine the amount of time that's needed at each visit to develop a fee schedule so you need to consider the amount of time that you are taking for these certain things so the consult how much time and equipment how much staff time is used for that for the actual contact lens fitting are you doing this all yourself or are you having technicians that are able to help you because if you're spending an hour with the patient of doctor time that is going to be very expensive compared to if some technicians are able to help you and cut down some of that chair time cost same thing for the dispense are you doing everything or do you have the help of some technicians to help you with any of this stuff with the training in the beginning since we didn't have any specialty lens patients in my practice I had to do all of this stuff so I had to train every patient teach them insertion removal and lens care until we could get some of the staff trained um, same thing for follow-ups are you doing all of the testing are you operating the OCT if you're going to be using that are you at the consult are you operating the topographer or are technicians helping you I mean these are just definitely some things to think about when you're developing your fee schedule you also need to consider the cost of supplies and equipment at each visit so for the consult are you using a topographer are you doing other testing I like to do OCTs of the of the macula and the optic nerve at at the consult so I can see what's going on with the retina so there's no surprises um, also what are you using as far as plungers uh, saline solution bioglow and all these different types of, of things that you might be using at the lens fit and the same thing for the dispense and training you got to think of the contact lens kit that you're sending home with these patients is that something that is kind of incorporated into the whole global fee or are you charging the patients for their kit which may include a million different things um, in my practice we include some sodium chloride or some uh, you know insertion products right off the bat so they have something uh, we give them plungers we give them solutions and all these different things other practices don't give their patients any of that and they have to buy all of that so you have to kind of think of that as well what is actually included in this whole thing and then same thing for the follow-ups are you using bioglow or or you know sodium fluorescein are you using an OCT are, are the techs helping you so kind of think about the supplies and the equipment that you're using to also help develop your fee schedule so considering the amount of time that the patient is allotted and the amount of doctor time with the patient the cost of the supplies and your equipment then you can develop a fee schedule that's aligned with your specific chair time costs for me it's going to be a lot different than someone else um, some people only see six to eight patients a day and they're 
um, you know, chair time is going to be a lot less than somebody that's seen 60 patients a day. So you really have to think about uh, if, if this is worth it for you. And, 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 you know, most practices, it definitely is. But when you get to that point, you ha really have to sit down and think of your chair time and all the cost of these uh, special supplies that's involved. And then you can use that to kind of develop a schedule. There's also a really cool calculator if you have trouble and you like have no idea where to even start. If you go to uh, gpli.info, the Gas Permeable Lens Institute, it is also an, a nonprofit uh, site that it's an amazing organization that helps to teach practitioners and, and is a great resource for gas permeable lenses. But if you go under the resource tab, and you go to the professional fee calculator, that will actually bring up a plug and chug little system where you can actually plug everything in and it will spit out um, what it thinks you should be charging for some of these things. And this is what will show up. Basically, you kind of just complete all these different boxes and of course, the everybody uh, is gonna be different. So like for step one, how many hours do you see patients in a full workday? Maybe some people are only four hours, maybe some are 10. So of course this is going to vary drastically between practitioner to practitioner. But using this can really help you calculate some of your fees that you should be charging for your fitting and your lenses. With the fee schedule, it is a little bit different with vision insurances compared to medical insurances. Vision insurances, what they usually do is they will incorporate the lens fitting and the lenses into one lump sum. And this is going to include the fitting, the dispense, their training, all of the follow-up care within a certain time period, and then also the lenses themselves. So basically, they're going to give you one lump sum for all of this, no matter how many times you need to see the patient, no matter, no matter how many times you need to make changes to the lenses, it's all one sum. Whereas medical insurances are totally different. They will pay for the fitting as one charge, the lenses are going to be one charge, and then every single follow-up you see this patient are billed as separate charges. So if you see them for the dispense, it's going to be one charge. If you see them for their one-week follow-up, you're going to bill that as another charge, and so on and so forth. Some people may require being seen very frequently. Maybe it's a high-risk corneal transplant that you want to monitor quite often, and you're going to see them every week. So you would actually bill that visit to the medical insurance every time you see them. Here's just some common codes for scleral lens fitting. 92072, this is kind of an ambiguous code, and there's lots of articles out there and webinars and things, and uh, there's lots of debate on what this actually is. So in my office, we use it for patients that have keratoconus, and I think the thing that throws people off is the initial fitting. Does that mean you can only use this code one time, you know, when you first see them for the keratoconus fit? You know, what do you use the next year when you see them? Are you using the same code again? Or what if they've had another fitting at another practitioner's office and now they come to you? Do you still use that same code? The insurance companies can be helpful in determining when you need to use this code. There's some insurances that require you to use this code every single time you have the diagnosis of keratoconus. Other companies, they will only allow you to use it once in the patient's lifetime, which is their technical initial fitting the very first time they're fit. So just check with your insurance carriers and find out when they want you to use this code. Next. And next. 92313, this is kind of the closest code that we have for a scleral lens, even though it says corneal scleral lens, and then technically scleral lenses are not exactly the same as corneal scleral lenses. But a lot of vision insurances, they only have about four or five codes to choose. And so if you are going to go with a code for scleral lenses, this may be the most accurate one. Next. 
and next. And here's some of the V codes. So basically, this is the material codes that you're used for scleral lenses. V2531 is by far the most common code that you'll use. So if you are new to fitting scleral lenses, this is the code that you'll be using very, very often. And the description is contact lens gas permeable, which almost all scleral lenses are, and that is per lens. So you will divide that up with a modifier for the right and left eye if you're doing both eyes. V2530 is also technically a scleral lens, but is gas impermeable, meaning that it's made with something like PMMA material, which in most cases you will never do something like that. I have a couple patients where I have used this code because they have a non-seeing eye and they're using a scleral lens and we've kind of hand painted a prosthetic eye on top of it. Something to that nature is the only way you would use that V2530 code. Most of the time you will always be using that V2531 code. V2599 is contact lens other, other type. Um, I use this when I fit the impression technology lenses, such as like the eye print, because it doesn't, it's not really a scleral lens. There's a little bit more involved with the impression process and things like that. So that's when I would use that code. V2627 is the scleral cover, cover shell code. And that's usually used more so in medical insurances. And that's usually when you're treating a medical eye condition, such as dry eye, or maybe something's going on with their lacrimal gland or their tear film, things like that. And then you could also use V2799 if it doesn't fall into any of those categories or if the insurance company that you're using, it, they don't use any of these other codes, that's the only code that it would be appropriate for. So it just kind of depends on the vision insurance or medical insurance you're using and whatever is the most appropriate code uh, for that patient. Next. And here's just some numbers. Um, I just put some numbers in there for the ease of math. But for vision insurance, let's say you're doing a scleral lens fit on both eyes. You'll use that 92313 code. Let's just say your fee is $200. Then the scleral lens device itself is that V code 2531. And you would put the modifier RT for the right eye. Let's just say your fee is $400 for that. Scleral lens device for the left eye, same thing, except you're just using that LT modifier. So the total bill to vision insurance is $1,000, and that's one lump sum for all the services and all of the lenses that you're using. Next. Next. Most vision insurances will reimburse medically necessary contacts, and each insurance is are different so and they change from year to year so every single vision insurance is totally different their fee schedules totally different and like i said year to year they pay drastically differently uh, we used to have a vision insurance that paid really really well for scleral lenses and then a few years back they decided they were not going to pay very well for it um, so you have to kind of determine that as a practitioner if that's something that you are okay with. If you want to stay on the contract with that vision insurance, then you may have to just kind of accept the, the things they're giving you. Or if you don't feel like it's appropriate for what you feel like your time um, is worth, um, it might be worth considering um, not taking that vision insurance for specialty contacts. Something that's really important is that most all vision insurances will cover either glasses or contacts, but they will not cover both. Next. And also holds true for medically necessary contacts. So they'll either cover medically necessary contacts or glasses, or they'll cover medically necessary contacts or regular contacts. So you're not going to get the most vision insurances to cover um, both of these types of things. Next. So if the patient has actually used up their benefits for glasses or contacts, they will not be eligible for medically necessary contacts until the next year. And there are some um, ways around this. Sometimes, like with VSP, for example, a patient has gotten glasses, but then we've discovered later or we've gotten a patient that's uh, been referred over 
that we've discovered actually has some sort of condition, let's say like keratoconus, and we'll call the vision insurance and say, hey, we I know this patient got glasses and we used up their benefit, but we've discovered they actually have this eye disease and their vision's going to be much better if we fit them into a specialty lens. And they will actually go back and uh, rescind that auth and they can kind of start that over. So there are some insurances that will work with you depending on the patient condition and their diagnosis. Uh, so something to keep in mind, but as a general rule of thumb, if they've already used their benefits, they're not going to be able to get medically necessary contacts this year. So kind of step-by-step step or just a little, um, just kind of some tips on how to bill VSP. If you have a patient who's a candidate for specialty lenses, it's it's my advice to actually call VSP and find out what they are actually eligible for because some plans do not cover medically necessary contacts. Some plans will cover medically necessary contacts but only to a certain amount. So like for instance, I had a patient the other day that they had medically necessary contact lens benefits but only up to $300 and then the patient was responsible for 85% over that amount. So these are just kind of the fine print things that we really need to pay attention to because you could get burned, the patient could be upset because maybe they didn't know that they didn't have these benefits um, and they can't maybe afford these types of things. So you just have to really kind of dial in to what the, the insurance is telling you uh, the patient's eligible for. If the patient's eligible, They'll give you an authorization number, which is really helpful because then when you're putting everything in, you're able to use that as kind of like a tracking device. So if something happens and let's say they got rejected because they weren't eligible for whatever reason, you can give them that authorization number and say, hey, you guys already gave us this authorization and said they were fully covered up to X amount. So, you know, that can really help if they're, if something happens that's weird with the insurance. Then, after you do the fitting, you'll go on to ifinity.com, and then you'll enter all the information as far as the lens fitting, the diagnosis, and the actual lens device itself. And VSP is different because they pay on the type of contact lens fitting, and then also the type of contact lens that you're using. As a general rule, VSP will pay higher for hybrid lenses and scleral lens fittings compared to other modalities such as gas permeable lenses and standard soft custom soft lenses. They also pay according to the diagnosis. They will pay more for what they determine to be a more severe diagnosis. For instance, if you are billing a scleral lens for high myopia, VSP is not going to pay you as much as they would for somebody that has a corneal transplant. So it's it's important to look at the handbook and find out exactly what they're paying you um, and how much they're going to pay you for that diagnosis. Here's just an example of some um, diagnoses that are considered VSP maximum benefits. So keratoconus is, um, of course, one graft versus host disease, corneal transplant, staphyloma. Um, some of these things are, you know, really, really um, important and kind of severe diagnoses, so they're going to pay more for those. Next. So for IMED, it's a little bit different. Basically, if you think someone's a good candidate, have the a billing department call IMED and see if they are eligible for medically necessary contacts. They'll also give you an authorization number. Um, I guess they kind of stopped doing this a while back, so they may not give that to you, but at least you can write down the reference number for the call and the rep that you spoke with. Then you'll just print out the medically necessary form that's only one page and then fill it out and then fax it to IMED. Here's a picture of um, the, what the form looks like. You can find this on the provider website. And basically, it's just a one-page thing with the patient's information and the provider information. And then these little boxes kind of in the middle um, are a little bit hard to see. But basically, it just kind of tells them what the uh, problem is. Do they have keratoconus? Um, do they have high amotropia? What's, do they have a pediatric condition? So some of these conditions will pay more than others based off of 
um, the type, the diagnosis of the actual patient. Next. So medically, like I said before, you'll bill each visit medical, and every time you see the patient, you're going to bill them um, each, each visit. So make sure you're issuing an advanced beneficiary notice, and make sure you're telling these patients what to expect. Um, the worst thing you can do is just kind of let the patient feel like it's only a one-and-done type of thing with... Um, uh, medical, well, with any uh, scleral lens fitting or any specialty lens fitting, it's always a good idea to um, have the patients know what's going to happen and um, and what to expect. Um, and I think at this time we'll take some questions uh, for the rest of the webinar. All right, very good. Thank you both so much. Uh, I've got a couple questions here. Uh, this is just kind of a true or false question. It says uh, states with non-covered nominal reimbursement laws can balance bill uh, when usual and customer fees are not paid by the insurance. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so you have to look at the contract and what it states because in some cases it will say uh, this insurance will pay up to, let's say, $500 and then the patient is responsible for 100% of the remaining balance, or maybe it says they're responsible for 80% of the remaining balance. So you have to follow the guidelines of the insurance uh, depending on what they say. And I'll add to that if you don't mind. In Missouri, we just recently uh, passed a non-covered services bill, um, but as a way to kind of skirt around that, some of the vision insurances will have you sign a separate contract uh, that that sometimes has less uh, exposure to to patients. And, and so if you sign one of those, you can sometimes balance bill, but if you stay on the original contract, you can't. So there's, they get kind of tricky with that. And you gotta be really careful because I know in audit situations, they can be pretty, uh, pretty angry about those type of things. All right, next question. Um, and as and I did play too, does the law not supersede the contract? Again, that's gonna be very state by state. And, and it really depends, like Stephanie said, on your contract. Uh, next question for you, Steph. I was under the impression that 92313 was a unilateral code and needed a, an RT and an LT. Uh, and then on top of that, in the case of keratoconus, could you bill a 92072 and a 92313 at the same time? So you can't bill 92072 and 92313 at the same time. It has to, it's either one or the other. And then 92313, the information that I've had is that it is a bilateral code, but you can break it up into RT and LT, which is what I do for like uh, VSP. I separate it out and that's just, it, for some reason, they like understand it better and they and there's less problems with reimbursement. When I just bill the 92313 as one thing um, and just bill one lump sum, like they have questions and that they don't pay the full amount or whatever it is so it, it's for some reason led to more complications but I think technically um, 92313 is a bilateral code but you could split it up um, to make it easier for the billing and ins uh, you know insurance companies to kind of see what's going on uh, I think about one more here when billing medical do you bill a 92072 and then v2531 Yes, so if you have a keratoconus patient, I would bill 92072, and then I would bill that V code uh, 2531 to the medical insurance. For the materials, very good. And I believe that is it. Uh, I'll, I'll hit another question if it comes up, but we pretty much hit our time limit. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, you'll be getting two emails as a follow-up to this webinar. Uh, one will have a survey. Uh, that, that asks just for some feedback on the lecture itself and really what we're looking for is any recommendations on future webinar topics, things of that nature. The second email will be from me uh, and it will be regarding uh, getting COPE credit for this course. Uh, because it's a remote course, there has to be a quiz involved, to be a 10 question quiz. You'll have to receive a 70% or better on that quiz to receive COPE credit. Uh, there'll be instructions in that email on uh, how to submit your answers and what's all needed to submit. 
Uh, that quiz should go out. The, the survey should go out today or tonight, I'm guessing, if not early tomorrow. The quiz will go out either t late tonight or some point tomorrow as well, and you'll have 10 days to get uh, the, the quiz back for COPE credit. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We have another uh, webinar coming up in about six weeks, and so keep an eye out for uh, an email regarding the date and time of that webinar. Thank you to our presenters, Dr. Barnett, Dr. Wu. Great job as always, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.